Good evening. It's September 20th, 2013. My name is Matthew Ogden, and I'd like to welcome you to our live webcast tonight on LaRouchePack.com. As usual, uh, on these Friday night events, we will be featuring Mr. Lyndon LaRouche, uh, and we will be posing a series of questions which Mr. LaRouche will have his responses to. Now, I'm joined in the studio tonight by Megan Beats of the LaRouche Pack scientific research team, the basement, um, and she will be joining me to pose the questions to Mr. LaRouche tonight. And I would like to ask Megan to come to the podium to pose our first question. Thank you. Uh, the first question comes to us from an institutional contact in Washington, D.C. Um, and the question is on the economic crisis in Europe. They say, Mr. LaRouche, with all of the recent focus on the Middle East, the ongoing economic crisis in Europe has tended to be forgotten. Yet Greece, to take one example, is going through a continuing collapse with six consecutive years of economic decline despite two bailouts. According to some accounts, the Greek unemployment rate is the highest in recorded European history. Spain, Portugal, and other European nations are not far behind Greece in the collapse process. Now it appears almost certain that Greece will need a third bailout very soon. Clearly, the policy of bailouts conditioned on austerity is not working. What is the alternative for Europe? How does the fight that you have led for Glass-Steagall in the United States, which has gained tremendous momentum in the past few weeks, relate to the European situation? Well, there's some things you have to take into account, and these are not restricted to Europe. They are international. But the difference is the difference in the situation in the United States from that of Europe. The problem is centered of this type that we're dealing with is centered in the British oligarchy, in the British system, or which is actually the Anglo-Dutch system. And this is a global system, which we can count at least not less than 40% of the total activity, of per personal activity, of people on the planet. And actually, the, if you want to draw the conclusions, of, which are more complicated, you can extend that to 60% and so forth of the total planet. So what you're dealing with is, uh, is has a simple solution. The, most of the problem is that, first of all, people are not producing anymore, or they are producing on a much reduced scale. They're not really producing anything to speak of. So the actual cont of the total amount of so-called dollar equivalent income passing through the system is increasingly large uh, in respect to money, but is becoming shrinking at an accelerating rate in express terms of reality. If you may have noticed that in recent years, you have a hyperinflation throughout the transatlantic region. Just think of prices when you go back to, say, 19, uh, six, well, take 1960. And you can. Uh, and what's happened in the more recent thing under, under the Bush and Obama. Under Bush and Obama, we've seen in the United States the greatest collapse of income pro capita in, the, in all recent history. This is a hyperinflationary thing which is killing people, and it tends to kill people. Now, the root of this thing starts from several things. First of all, it starts from the way the banking systems operate. Now, banking systems like the Wall Street system or the equivalent British system really are not banks. They're, thieve, they're thieving operations. Uh, the, the complication is not only are they stealing, like Wall Street steals. That's what it does. It steals. It doesn't earn anything. Look at the recent hyperinflation that started again and even shocked some of the people who have been pushing the hyperinflation before. So the, pro the problem is you're dealing with a hyperinflationary situation. Now, if we were, say, we apply Glass-Steagall, we would, what we'd do, we would shut down and foreclose banking systems such as the Wall Street system and the equivalent European systems, we'd close them down. 
because all we have to do is call them in for an accounting and say, well, you've had this debt that you call debt. You've had this kicking around over there for a long time. You've never liquidated it. In other words, you are simply speculating, playing the game of boardwalk uh, in Monopoly. And so the game goes up, the prices go up, the money flows, the income reality collapses. So therefore, there's a good side to this, or beautiful side to which we say. The beautiful side, if we do the right thing, and if we put through Glass-Steagall, we will just automatically liquidate most of Wall Street and similar kind of institutions in Europe. You see, in Switzerland, for example, in the Swiss banks, are now causing a crisis uh, feeling throughout much of Europe because you know the Swiss big banks now one of them at least is going back to reality or toward reality and that is a threat to everybody because they're not going to they're, they're kicking out they're not going to go with this anymore they know they can't survive it not in the Swiss economy and the Swiss society is different the way they react is different than the rest of Europe so if we put through Glass-Steagall effectively, as it now seems a feasible proposition, this is not something that might happen by magic, this is something which would be a natural thing to happen. It, in other words, we've, it's come to that point. Wall Street and the similar kind of clowns um, really don't have much grip on anything anymore. All they have is gangster muscle, and you're going to find more of it. But if we put through Glass-Steagall, and we're getting on the edge of putting through Glass-Steagall, and putting Glass-Steagall in will have a lot of impl implications, which will be wonderful. Not perfect, but wonderful nonetheless. Because we'll simply, we'll, we will actually be forced to foreclose on Wall Street and similar institutions and practices in Europe and so el elsewhere. Now that means that the, the burden on the population of the United States and Europe, for example, will collapse. Because if we put into Glass-Steagall, the system of the national system will be based on Glass-Steagall and on the institutions that go together with Glass-Steagall. So that we will cut those things off. They're not on the agenda. Because we're going to issue a credit system and most of the income that is going to be circulating in, the, in society is going to be the income that we do on the basis of a credit system. Just exactly what Alexander Hamilton prescribed in his day. So the, the idea of this terrible debt, debt, it can be wiped out. Not in really entirely. But if we chi shift so we don't no longer borrow or take credit in the swindling system, and you go back to a real system, which is Glass-Steagall, you will automatically have a fundamental shock-like change in the situation for the be betterment of the people. It will not be perfect because other things have to be done. But we can have a very sudden point where this hyperinflation, we blow it out. How? We bankrupt them. Because they don't, they don't work, they're not worth anything. They're using the control over their political control now, the other side of this is the force behind this, typified by the British monarchy. Now, the British monarchy is not the British monarchy. It's the Anglo-Dutch monarchy. It's a, it's a worldwide empire, which is the dominant empire on the planet, is the Anglo-Dutch system of empire. And even though it, you know, I've put, gave them the credit for the modest 40% of world income, of world rent, they actually are larger in terms of the gambling, but we shut them down because we changed the system. What we've done, we've destroyed the real economy for the sake of the speculative economy, which produces almost nothing. For example, when the auto industry was shut down in the United States and essentially shipped out to China and so forth, what happened? That was the end of real productivity. And when you similar things happened in agriculture, so there you take the big centers in industrial production and similar related kinds of production, and then agriculture you're putting down, what's left of your economy? 
So therefore, what we're in a deal with is not worrying about how this terrible thing is going to hurt us in terms of a hyperinflation. We can deal with a hyperinflation. We have to make the political decisions in government which cause us to dump the swindlers and put them out of business or mercy something or other. And we simply will change things. We will cancel prices. You, you think if we can't cancel as what we should in terms of London, France, and Wall Street in the United States alone, you, do you realize how much of that stuff will just be wiped out? Now, what would be the effect of wiping out all those debts? No. The, the debts given uh, signed to the people will collapse. That will actually tend to import, import grow, grow, growth. Because if you're forcing this system, you're going to find things like simple foodstuffs and so forth, things you require are going to be, seem cheaper because you're not going to pay this crazy tax, which is the oligarchical tax. Now, the other side of this thing, which has another side, is that the intention of the British Queen and the intention of those throughout Europe, like the Anglo-Dutch, are the worst, or the Saudis, among the worst. So you take those groups and you put them where they belong, in jail, for example. And you do that, and you find that suddenly things cost a lot less. Now, that's not going to be a good situation. It's a good situation from the standpoint of money with respect to people. The cruelty will be lessened. The possibility of getting something going will be increased. Hmm? And, but that means we then have to go to a driver program, a science-based driver program, to get some real production going. That was all we're do on the verge of doing right now is simply to wipe out the, the swindlers. And that we are free of the tax, which comes into everybody's purchasing power, the tax of the swindler tax. That does not cause growth. It does tend to imp improve the situation and will cause a shift of the money flow from pure swindling to some internal economy measures in Europe and the United States. But what we need, really need to do is to go with a fundamental reorganization of the planetary system. Now, the planetary, we are dealing with the planetary system, which now has a little bit of a problem in it. Because if people don't use thermonuclear fusion, if they don't clean up the act and get, get serious about this stuff and stop these games they're playing, if we do that, if we make that change, then we will have a rapidly accelerating growth of productivity and naturally consumption. And this will plan, you know, our plan is, as now, is from the Mississippi River, especially down below the Missouri Junction, which is the, the area which is starving for lack of water or lack of conditions of life. So we take this whole area just below the Canadian border, and below that, into Mexico. If we put that system into work, we, and with the kind of water system and driver system, which goes beyond Nuapa, which goes across not only the, the western part of the United States, and Mexico, and actually flows into Canada as well, and Alaska, but it goes into Asia. So it would be the greatest driver program that mankind has ever conceived. It will come, it'll start relatively slow in terms of rates of growth and so forth. But this means an end to that system. It means an end to the kind of political system too, which does that sort of stuff that's been, that's been doing. It means that these guys are going to go into the poor box. They'll try to raid it, but they'll, they'll be there, they'll be res taking residence there in the meantime. But the only way to understand this is to say, what is the alternative? Are you going to complain about it and say that great injustice is being per per perpetrated? Of course it's being perpetrated. But if you do something about it, it's not going to be perpetrated anymore. Now it's just a problem, a challenge to solve the problem. And to do that, two things. 
first of all, shut that thing down, shut that system down, and go back to an honest system and try to manage. The, uh, the drop in costs, the actual earned costs or incurred costs, will drop the time you shut down Wall Street and do the same thing in relevant periods of Europe, which means we get a respite, which gives us an opportunity to change these things. Then we have to do a large project, which will probably come chiefly if we can get the thermonuclear program going, thermonuclear fusion program going. And there are problems in getting it going. In principle, it will work. But you have to have the, the system organized to make it work in principle. In that case, we are, mankind is headed for the greatest achievements in the coming 50 years and along the way in those 50 years the greatest achievements of mankind ever known. And that will solve the problem temporarily. And then we'll have to do some other things. That's the way to look at it. Don't, let's not be playing, we got this thing that's going to hang around us. It doesn't have to be continued. It doesn't have to be the situation. And the best thing is just simply bankrupt the British Empire, bankrupt things like it, bankrupt the swine in the United States. Swine are to be eaten, not to be uh, enriched. Well, I'd like to follow up then on what you've just raised in terms of the driver program and ask you a question on the fusion economy. Um, just to mention, currently there's an international conference on fusion power occurring in uh, Spain, which has brought together over 500 of the world's top fusion scientists and engineers. And the conference is the 11th International Symposium on Fusion Nuclear Technology. Uh, such symposiums have been held every two to three years, bringing together these groups of scientists since 1988, with the goal of fostering collaboration among scientists and engineers working on fusion power. The hosts of this year's conference in Spain announced that the purpose of the symposium is to focus on, quote, both near-term fusion devices and long-term reactor technologies with special attention to science, engineering, experiments, facilities, modeling, analysis, design, and safety. The symposium included presentations by leading fusion scientists from South Korea, China, Japan, Russia, India, the United States, Europe, as well as leaders of the International Fusion Project, the ITER, International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor, that's currently being constructed in France. Now that being said, uh, the development of the peaceful use of thermonuclear fusion and the technologies that will be available to mankind that would come along with it. This is an effort which you have been spearheading for decades. Uh, since the original founding of the Fusion Energy Foundation in 1974 and the accompanying International Journal on Fusion Energy. Uh, throughout the 1980s, you and the FEF sponsored international conferences around the world on fusion, bringing together these leading scientists for the necessary dialogue. Now, currently, the Basement and 21st Century Science and Technology have just published a new report entitled Nuclear Nawapa 21, Gateway to the Fusion Economy. We've revived the campaign to win the political fight for fusion. In discussions yesterday with members of the scientific research team, you said, Without thermonuclear fusion, mankind has no future. Now we open the report with a call for an international Manhattan Project style collaboration and crash program with the leading scientists from around the world to achieve and conquer fusion. So I would appreciate it if you could make some remarks. <clears throat> the problem is, is that since the early 1970s, but particularly since 1980, 82, the, what has happened is the fusion program, the, or the real nuclear power program, has been shut down. It's been shut down in two areas. It's been shut down increasingly in the area of, of that simple uh, nuclear power, simple fission power. Uh, that's ended. You've just seen the virtual completion of the entire shutdown in, of the economy of Japan. 
And there's no way that Japan can continue to live if it continues that policy. Right? That's, and that's the problem in most parts of the world. The fact that we don't have any productive flavors. Now, this is in part, it's inevitable. Because if you know the difference between mankind and an ape, which some people in government seem not to know, uh, in matter of fact, the apes are blush and embarrassed when every time they bring up men these days <laughs> for that, just that, exactly that reason, is that mankind is the only species of its nature. We seem to look like monkeys. Some people behave like monkeys, and sometimes the monkeys are embarrassed to, know, to acknowledge them as cousins. But in, in the problem here is that it is inherent that mankind is the only species that has the willful power to increase its productivity. Yeah. So therefore, you ha it's the, and th this means that as you go from simple, you know, long time ago in Southern Africa, we, do, we have spotted cases where there are people that were, someone who said they're monkeys or they're baboons or gorillas or something. Yeah. And if they would find in some of these areas, they would find actual baboons and so forth, or baboon-like creatures, gorilla-like creatures and so forth. And this is the South African way where, where they got the best reports on this kind of stuff. But you had also one other kind of ape-like looking thing. And what it did in all of its sites that are notable, this monkey, who is not a monkey, used fire to cook his food and similar things. Now from that point on, which is a couple million years ago or so, uh, from that point on, we found that this species, which we now call human, which is characteristically based on fire, all kinds of fire. It starts out with simple fire, and it goes up the scale of chemistry to every increasing every energy flux density. Uh, we have now come to a point where we're dealing beyond anything that mankind knew before in terms of ordinary chemistry. We're now in the vein of thermonuclear fusion. If this means that the existence of the human species, the continued existence of the human species, now requires the utilization on a massive scale of thermonuclear fusion. We don't use coal anymore. And that's the principle. We, we still use coal. But we are going up to the level of chemistry so that the composition of human activity is based on increasing levels, in, you know, like, like species types, you know, which are a higher order of density. Now, if we're going to live, we are, have now entered a period of time where henceforth the minimum requirement is going to be based the inclusion of a driver program, which is based on thermonuclear fusion. You know? So we have naturally come to a point, as I've noted this thing, that we're now going to the point from the Mississippi River edge, especially down from where the Missouri comes into the Mississippi. This is the area, of the drought area now. It goes all the way down from that zone, and a similar thing happens on the coast, coastal mountain ranges of California. So now we're having a general collapse of this type. So now we ha what we have to do is we have to have a driver program which increases the e energy flux density of water. You know? We have to process water with higher density driven essentially at bottom by thermonuclear fusion. Now, the problem. What has happened since, uh, since my period of, get, of, of dealing with this issue back in the 1970s? What has happened since that time especially since the advent of the 1980s. There's been a consistent driving down of the energy flux density in the U.S. and European economies. So the, what happens is, though we do have thermonuclear fusion experiments, we don't have ones that can come to a conclusion. Why? Because the governmental system, including the British system, will not let us organize on the level of energy flux density of applied fusion products in order to make this thing work. If we do the right thing, and if we stop this nonsense 
about suppressing thermonuclear fusion, then we are going to be create the greatest system of growth that mankind has ever known. And it will be created in a region largely from west of the Mississippi, all the way across the ocean by way of Alaska and the Bering Straits into, in, into China and other parts of Asia. Also, we'll get the Carl Canal built, and that will change the whole character of, of that part of the world. So we will then take with very simple kinds of conceptions, simple in terms of categories. And these categories will ensure us that mankind is going to achieve things which mankind needs. And the point is, as contrary to these stupid people, these brutish stupid people who believe in the green policy, the green policy, if it continues, will be the death of mankind. We have to crush the green and get back into real stuff. And what's required is the, hist the history of man, the history of the biology of man, from something like a, a, a gorilla, looking something like a gorilla, in South Africa, but using fire for his subsistence. From there, man has continued the process of progress, not always consistently. The oligarchical system has arisen and crushed this kind of thing. But now we've come to the point where humanity will not exist for much longer without the benefits of full-scope thermonuclear fusion. That has to be our destiny, our immediate destiny. Now, I shan't be around to, to finish that process, but I am damn sh determined to make sure that other people continue the process and succeed. And that's the way to look at this thing. Well, let me ask a question on the subject of the opportunity to shift the paradigm which has dominated, as you've re referenced, uh, world policymaking and held the progress of humanity back. Um, in the wake of the strategic and diplomatic victory that President Vladimir Putin and Sergei Lavrov uh, won in the case of Syria, with the successful outflanking of Obama to defuse the bomb which would have detonated World War III had the operation in Syria gone forward. There are now similar efforts to achieve a similar result concerning the threat of war with Iran. Um, Hassan Rouhani, the newly elected president of Iran, has been making very public efforts at initiating a policy of what he calls constructive engagement. Uh, on the eve of his trip to New York City uh, for the upcoming General Assembly meeting of the United Nations, Rouhani has made several direct appearances in the United States press on NBC, NBC television and just yesterday in an op-ed that he published in the Washington Post, which have allowed him to speak directly to the American people, much in the same way that President Putin did in his op-ed of the New York Times from last week. And what President Rouhani asserts in this op-ed is that we have the urgent necessity of overcoming the ingrained Cold War mentality of zero-sum game, geopolitical unilateralism, and imperialism in the favor of constructive engagement, as he calls it, between great powers in the spirit of mutual benefit and security. And he emphasizes that the key to this kind of dialogue is the recognition and the respect for different distinct cultures and national identities of sovereign states. And the only way to establish this new paradigm in international relations is to cease focusing on the negatives and to begin uh, focusing on a positive vision for the future of all of humanity. So his, his uh, appeal to world leaders is to have the courage to look beyond rivalries of the present and to embrace a vision of the future that they wish to create for their children and their grandchildren. So 
I think it's significant that these initiatives from Rouhani and from Vladimir Putin both come in the wake of the recent meetings of the SCO in, uh, in China, where Rouhani and Putin and President Xi Jinping were in dialogue uh, about precisely this, this vision of the future, uh, what Xi Jinping defined as the New Silk Road or the Eurasian Land Bridge. And uh, this is something which you've emphasized for years would be based on the principle of the Treaty of Westphalia, um, the benefit of the other, or in other words, the common interest of mankind. And this is something which has also been the basis of the proposals for the SDE, the Strategic Defense of Earth. So my question is, with this clear opportunity for a paradigm shift in our hand, how can we secure the necessary political victories in order to make this possible? Well, the problem is, is that the optimistic view, which is implied by Iran, implied by China, implied by Russia, is in a sense an accident and it will not solve the problem. Because remember that when you, we've come to the point where weapons which decide wars are thermonuclear weapons. Now the very fear of the thermonuclear factor terrifies people. It's worse than that. We've reached the point that war as we have known it among human beings is no longer possible if human beings wish to survive. Because when you come to the point that the existence of society depends upon thermonuclear fusion, you no longer have the option of simply negotiating peace. Now what you will preserve, because culture is so important, that the cultures of various nations and peoples are things which will continue to be, maybe decreasingly in, all, in the long term, but for the, for the immediate period, for the next couple of centuries, the planet is going to be based on national cultures in one way or the other. And therefore, the national cultures naturally tends to lead, if you're irrational, to peace, not to war. So we, this is not a, the idea that this is an opportunity to avoid collision. It doesn't work. Because the problem is if you don't develop thermonuclear fusion now, you're not going to be able to maintain an assured defense of the existence of the human species. Therefore, you're, while the peace orientation, it, it, as I've just described it, summed it up, Yes, that is necessary, but what's the positive basis for it? The fact that you refrain from doing something bad does not mean that you're going to do something good. So you have to have a driver of self-interest which goes beyond these kinds of considerations. And what we need to do is drive now and stop this nonsense and get a thermonuclear fusion driver. We have on our hands, if we can c cut the suppression of thermonuclear fusion, what well, we have a system now where they're playing games with thermonuclear fusion. They're not allowing it to, get to work. They're not giving it the opportunity to be applied in the level of intensity which we can fairly estimate is required to do the job. Because what we're going to do is we're going to take the, the Pacific Ocean and both sides of it from the Mississippi across the region, up through the Bering Straits, and into Asia. And that area is going to be developed on the basis of a thermonuclear fusion driver. It will probably take up to 50 years to get this thing to organized. Maybe we'll, do, we'll be lucky and, do, and get it in less. But this is the only secure basis for the future of humanity, because we have to, on the other hand, we have to defend Earth against these these obstacles, these asteroids. And big, one big asteroid hitting Earth can just knock out the entire human population. We have no defense against that. Hmm? And that's an example of the reality we face. 
You have all these people with their opinions. My opinion, his opinion, her opinion, the child's opinion, the monkey's opinion. Huh? It doesn't work. If you're going to deal with the universe, and that's what we're dealing with, this is not some little park you're living in called Earth. This is a part of the solar system, and the solar system is a pygmy, and it's stupid. The solar system is going to sleep on us now. And the world is going to get cold and colder. We've had cold periods of that type before, when the sun decided to take a long-term nap, which it's doing now. And the best indications are just exactly that. So we are going to need that. We are also, do you know what it takes to deal with an asteroid which is determined to kill you all off? Do you know what the means is, the organization that's required? So therefore, the very existence of man depends on changing their stupid attitudes and realizing that mankind has been achieved because we have the gift of creativity, which no other species has. Hmm? It's by using our creativity, which leads us to higher orders of, of capability, that mankind can survive and achieve and find a useful place for it in the whole system. I'm always going to live on Mars. We, but we can put devices and create them from Earth and put them on Mars and we can do all kinds of things up there, including help to run up a system to defend Earth and Mars, for example, from these a asteroids that are dangerous. And nothing's being done about it. Yes, some people are tinkering with this thing and talking about it, thinking about experiments, but they're not getting ready to do the job. And what we, mankind needs is a complete change from attitude on this account. Yes, we are going to have nations and national cultures. We're going to defend them. We're going to maintain them and promote them. But we're not going to kill each other. Because that's just plain stupid. And what you've got is, you, the problem you've got is empires. You've got the imperial system. And for a long time, we don't even know too clearly how this worked out. But the, what a division occurred between two kinds of human beings oligarchs and slaves. And you are mostly slaves in that category. And the, what, the, what the oligarchs chance was say, well, mankind, if mankind is, have a large population, then the, mankind will take over away from the oligarchy. Therefore, we must periodically kill off mankind in general in order to protect ourselves against for, in behalf of the oligarchy. That's what the Queen is doing. The whole rumpus now is based on the Queen's policy of reducing the human population to one billion or less from its present level of seven billion. That's what this whole confusion is. And therefore what you've got to do is you've got to get rid of the oligarchy, including what the Queen of England represents. You've got to get rid of it. Because this is what's controlling the planet. And if we, if we just sit and try to do what we do as we do now, mankind won't survive. If you want mankind to survive, you've got to accept the preconditions of development, which are necessary to permit the possibility of man's survival. Under those conditions, mankind can do very well. But right now, we've got the problem. We've got. The western areas of the United States and northern Mexico and so forth are hopeless right now. The United States is dying physically because of Wall Street and the Queen of England. These are the forces that are destroying the ability of human beings to live as a species. And therefore we need, a pro we need projects which do a multiple number of things that we need done. We need, to, we need to protect man now as a species. We need to free man from the slavery that Wall Street merely typifies. Shut down Wall Street. It doesn't earn anything. It's not good for anything. Huh? If it does anything good, it's an accident. Huh? We need bigger accidents of that kind. Huh? And take them out. We need the end of the oligarchical system. And if we don't get that, then the very weapons which we could use to save mankind would be used by mankind against itself.
So the time has come, no bones about it. Anybody who's got a different opinion, contrary to what I just said, is an idiot. Okay, our next question comes from a longtime contact and supporter in Argentina. And he says, Mr. LaRouche, greetings from Argentina. How can the globalist oligarchy have power, political, economic, ideological, cultural, etc., without using the creative powers which are unique to human beings? And why is it that those who do employ those powers do not have power? Or is it a mistake to even apply the attribute power to the oligarchy? Or also, could it be that the power which the oligarchy employs is made possible by the fact that there are not enough people on a world scale who use their creative powers? Well, that is certainly absolutely true. My congratulations to the gentleman. It's an excellent, it's an excellent sentiment and not a mere sentiment. That's true. But it, what the key thing is what I've just said. We have to understand that mankind is an evolutionary animal and not an animal. And mankind de depends upon the noetic powers which no other known living species ever exhibited. That is therefore mankind's inbred mission, its inbred capabilities, its identity. What the oligarchy, which suppresses the creativity, is therefore the enemy of mankind in man's clothing. Maybe we should take all their clothing away or something like that so they would be embarrassed in two senses of the term embarrassed. Yeah. So the point is the failure, to, the failure to recognize that man has an obligation to survive. And surviving is not simply defending yourself against the neighbor next door. It's the requirement to realize that this solar system, which is a very low-grade system, you know, this is not a big system. This is a poor little thing on the edges of our, our solar of our, of our galaxy, right? Not that big a deal. And it gets weak, it goes to sleep on the job, as it's doing now. <laughs> You're not heating up the place anymore. It's getting, going to get colder. You're going to freeze. So it, it's this quality of mankind, in mankind. Man, mankind has to understand himself. And I think one of the problems is we believe in, uh, we believe in a lot of things that are silly, but they're popular. Uh, we got a... <laughs> neighbor by nearby. Anyway, so that that this what we have to do is understand we've come to the end of the possibility of running the planet the way it's been run by mankind so far. What we have is we have tickles. We have cases in which gestures have t been made in the direction of proving what mankind is and can be. And apart from all these damn idiots and fools. And therefore, we, what we have to do is, instead of sitting back and saying, well, it's not our time, it's not the t they won't let us do this now, it's not our time. We have to go along with the way things are. That's just plain stupidity. I mean, you have to realize what a poor little solar system we live in. And we think Jupiter is a mighty object out in that solar system, when well, the whole system is going to go to sleep on us. What are you kidding yourself? Which means that mankind has intellectual capabilities innate to mankind. These have to be called forth. And instead of trying to use ordinary opinions, we've got to say, what is it that threatens man, even by our negligence? And how do we do something about it? How do we defend ourselves against asteroids which could wipe out mankind on Earth in one blow? and similar kinds of things in this planet. Obviously, mankind has to act as really bigger than the sun, not in size, not in weight, not in temperature, but mankind is smarter than the sun. We just have to learn, learn that fact.
Um, at the beginning of this week, LaRouche Pack TV posted a video titled Profile in Courage, an interview with Representative Cornelius Gallagher. Uh, Neil Gallagher is a former congressman from New Jersey, and the interview covers his experience fighting almost single-handedly against the secret government that had taken over the United States in the wake of Franklin Roosevelt's death and was largely responsible for the assassination of John F. Kennedy 50 years ago and the reign of terror that was asserted over Congress by J. Edgar Hoover's FBI. And you emphasize that uh, Congressman Gallagher is a hero of this nation, a great servant who should be honored for what he did and be given the justice that he deserves, that he's been denied for the courage that he had to fight when many others had failed for reasons of cowardice or moral corruption. Um, now what Gallagher describes is a process of behavior modification of the United States Congress, uh, which caused Congress and many who came to Washington with great intentions and um, patriotic ideals to be morally corrupted and to give up on their fight uh, such that they could no longer look at themselves in the mirror. And Congressman Gallagher said, I refused to live like that. So this behavior modification which he described then, which was imposed through blackmail, through intimidation, through slander, and even assassination, both threatened and actual, persists to this day. Today, what we see in Washington is the same type of secret government control operating from behind the scenes in Congress. Not only do we have the Snowden revelations about the NSA domestic surveillance, which is something that Congressman Gallagher was one of the original opponents of, uh, but we have Wall Street bribing and intimidating our elected officials, as we've seen direct reflections of recently in the fight over Glass-Steagall. And, as of this week, the role of the Saudis in buying up members of Congress uh, has become uh, glaringly clear. This week, we've circulated a leaflet in Washington titled, Do the Saudis Own Your Congressman? And the, uh, that was also the title of a large banner which we had erected outside Washington this past Wednesday on Capitol Hill, which certainly made some waves. And several news stories have been published, including in the Wall Street Journal, about the role of Prince Bondar uh, in funneling massive amounts of cash into the pockets of several key members of the Senate and the House, um, with intelligence expert Wayne Matson even speculating that perhaps this cash originated from the money that was uh, accrued through the Saudi BAE slush fund under the auspices of Al Yamama, uh, which was also the money that was involved in financing the attacks of 9-11. Now, what we've done in this past week is to crack this Saudi apparatus wide open. Uh, last week, Congressman Walter Jones issued a press release in which he announced that he actually had the opportunity to read the secret classified 28 pages of the original 9-11 Commission report, which reportedly deal with the Saudi role in coordinating and financing the support network behind the attacks of 9-11. And uh, what has happened now in the wake of Jones's announcement is that this initiative has set the precedent and opened the door and has caught the attention of congressmen from both the Republican and the Democratic side who are now saying in direct conversations that we've had with them, both Republican and Democrat, saying, I have to see those 28 pages. If Jones has seen them, then I have to follow in his footsteps and use my clearance to do the same. And I have to know what those 28 pages contain. So my question is, in taking on this secret government apparatus, which is the expression of the Anglo-Dutch oligarchical system inside the United States, what lessons 
must members of Congress learn from the experience of both Congressman Gallagher and yourself? And what will give these congressmen the strength to endure the type of threats and abuse which come along with taking on the enemies of this nation? Uh, this is a slightly complicated matter. Uh, first of all, what's obvious is that as long as the British system, the Anglo-Dutch system, dominates this planet, there is no real hope for humanity on this planet. So that rubbish has to be removed. That's the first thing. Uh, and we have, to have an, we have to mobilize people on the basis of being tough on them because what they're doing is in one sense what it was customarily to be done was cowardice prevailed. What we've seen recently since, well it started probably in uh, the fall or, or late spring of the previous year. We got some guts began to flow and our organization, as small as it was, was able to start something happening in a direction which uh, caught on with other people. Not because they were our, some kind of attachment to us, but because they, when they saw what we were saying, recognized that that was their interest too. Not that it was our interest to, to, you know, to support them, but they knew it was their interest too. And that I, were, I was doing something about it. We were doing something about it. It seemed timid at the first. But as you notice, and recently, uh, in California in particular, uh, in Delaware first, but then in California, Wall Street suddenly realized that they had gone to sleep that I was taking over the nation. No, I was not taking over the nation, as any of you know. But I, we were leading, we were providing a movement which had a self-authoritative characteristic. And because we stick to it, stuck, stuck to the thing, and because we were right, and people more and more recognized we were right. And they also recognized what a bunch of stinking bums we had on the other side. So what we've had now, we have a process where Glass Steagall, but also other things, is now a in factor which is influencing the entire population. And only bad people in general still like Wall Street. And even Wall Street doesn't like Wall Street. We saw recently where some of them have tried to hold back on the hyperinflation, and they, some of the other guys were going along with the real hyperinflation, the most stupid thing they could possibly do. Because, you know, sometimes criminals are stupid as well as being criminals. They're nasty, but they're no good for themselves or anybody else. And so the situation is now that we have to concentrate on things which I said earlier this evening, before you, and we have to get people to halt and think. Realize that Jupiter is not the problem. Saturn is not the problem though we think there's some Saturnalia going on in London, but that's not the matter. But this is, this is the thing we have to base on. We have to realize what I said earlier. Mankind has to recognize its des destiny, which is not some miracle thing out there. It's simply that we have certain capabilities because we are human and because we have a quality that no other a animal has. Mankind is the only species that is capable of forecasting the future. Therefore, we have the greatest power that you can imagine by being human beings. The greatest power inside the solar system is the creativity of mankind. And that's what we must base ourselves on. That's what's, you know, what Gallagher was doing, the same thing. He was saying, Take, take, the, take the good things and make the good things in life your weapons for better. And so the, the, we simply have to understand that you, can, you have no right to be stupid. You have no right to 
suck the blood of the oligarchs. You have no right. You have no right for stupidity. You have a commitment given to you by the fact that you're creative, that you have the power to know the future. So you cannot be excused for disregarding the future. And that's where we are. And we just have to hope that more people realize what I've said. Mankind is the only creature that is capable of forecasting the actual future, which has been my profession for a number of years, a number of decades. Mankind has that innate capability. And all the people say you can't know the future are the damn poor, damn fools. Anyone, if they're properly educated and have the guts to do so, can be a person who can foresee the future, in some degree or not, but recognize that that's a fact, that you can foresee what you are walking into. And you must act to deal with what you're going into, walking into. And those who have not the, lack the ability to do that are failures. So I'd like to ask you one final question as a follow-up to uh, comments you just concluded on the issue of art and creativity. On uh, Monday, in the regular discussion with the LaRouche Pack Policy Committee, you remarked, th as you've just done here, that the greatest threat to mankind is that we still tend to think of ourselves in this peasant mentality. We still tend to think and behave as if animals, dependent on sense perception, believing the literality of sense perception. Um, this is also the theme of the report that you've just concluded, called the thesis. On Monday, you stated that the way to overcome this is through something very precious, which is classical art. There you said, we have to understand that music is not only entertainment. Gr that great classical drama is not entertainment, but is a very essential part of reality, without which there is no reality. And, th that, and that is not understood, because for too long, under the influence of the oligarchical system, we've taken a precious thing like classical music and called it entertainment. Now, I completely agree. Music is not entertainment at least not in the way that people think of it today. But it is an integral part to the way that the human mind works and the way in which the human mind has access to his own capability to understand truth in the universe. This is completely against the oligarchical outlook. Now, just to add in, there was an interesting interview published this week with the new Pope Francis. And under the subheading within that interview, Art and Creativity, Pope Francis says, among musicians, I love Mozart, of course. The et incarnatus est from his mass in C minor is matchless. It lifts you to God. Mozart fulfills me. But I cannot only think about his music, I have to listen to it. I like listening to Beethoven, but in a Promethean way. And the most Promethean interpreter for me is Furtwängler. And then... Bach's Passions. The piece by Bach that I love so much is the Erbarmadich, the tears of St. Peter in the St. Matthew's Passion. Sublime. So I was wondering if you could comment on this issue of classical art, the human mind, and the access to truth. Yes. It's another example of the case of where people make mistakes about things. Now, they, people think that numbers and so forth are very are practical and very important. But that's not true. It's simply not true. On the other, because what, what you, we have people act on the basis of what? Sense perception. That's what they act on. Now, what does sense perception do? It does exactly what you know sense perception does. It guides you on the basis of sense and so forth, uh, smell sense, right, into uh, following certain tricks. Now what happens? We find the people who are following these senses huh, completely fail, repeatedly fail. So that when you're following sense perception, 
you are headed for failure. Now, what do you do? You, you have what's called morality. Now, what's the components of morality? Well, components of morality are not really involved in sense perception. They do are involved with the effects of sense perception, yeah? if you run on that basis alone. But we have what we call morality. And most people don't understand morality. They use the term, don't understand what it means. But it means that you find that, well, let me put, put, put it this way to make it work, come out as a coherent composition. The problem with sense perception is that it's useful for only certain things. It is useless on Mars. It is useless in other situations of that type. So we, we use other qualities of experience other than sense perception. Would they have a relationship to sense perception? Because they interpret sense perception. They, just, they, they define it. They say what's wrong and what's right. And what they say, their way they define what's right and what's wrong in, in sense perception is what defines them as human, as effectively human. Now, what do we know? positively. We know classical artistic composition. We know, th we know things about how this, well take uh, uh, the whole history of science is based on that. That sense and other things are, are part, it says, and sense perception is the least important of our capabilities. Sense perception alone defines ignorance, crudity, and so forth. And something, then something warns you that sense perception is such, if you're following that, greed and so forth ensues. So what, what do you do? You get an insight into how the human mind actually works to solve problems. And that's how I know. Because, and what it is, you are then compelled to do what no animal can do. You are compelled to foresee the future. How do you know the future? You relate, your idea of the future is related to what you know are higher principles of the universe than sense perception. So you interpret sense perception, you use sense perception, but pretend it. You don't worship it. You don't give way to it. You're not a practical person. And the meaning of a practical person in the crude sense is you simply follow your nose, your sense perceptions, your possession of this, uh, your pleasure in that. And is so the true, true, true and scientific discovery, the work of people like Max Planck, uh, you know, Max Planck, or Einstein, and you you find that nothing has been done significantly since Planck and Einstein on certain categories which are fundamental to human knowledge about the, about the universe. So we re rely upon categories which are not sense perception. We, we acknowledge sense perception. But when you're out in space, how can you have sense perception? You can't, you can't go in that way, way, way. So the problem, the problem here is to recognize, as I do, because it's only on the basis of sensing the future and knowing something about the future that you relate that to your sense perception. And you judge your sense perception whether it's right or wrong on the basis of those considerations. And what we have is a bunch of crude, stupid monsters who say, I'm practical. I'm practical. I don't need that. I'm practical. I've got sense perception. I know what's going on. I have sense perception. And what are they? They're brutes. And if, if you don't have these abilities to see things through the mind of a creative artist or something like that, you don't know anything. You're just taking a wild guess. But when it comes to your effect on the human species, on mankind in the universe, sense perception doesn't do you any good. You have to have something else, insight to the effect of what you're doing on mankind, on the human species. And the question of understanding what the human species' mission is. Otherwise, how do you know what to do? Most people don't.
we have to help them. Thank you very much, Lynn. Um, that brings a conclusion to our webcast for tonight. I'd like to thank Megan for joining me tonight, and uh, I'd like to thank all of you for tuning in. So, good evening. That brings a conclusion to our broadcast tonight. Stay tuned.